Hello and welcome to another episode of Monday Markets. As always, you're brought to you by Woo. Links available in the description below. As BTC is approaching its all-time high, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about all-time highs in general and make two specific points. The first is from Lowstrife, who's a very experienced crypto trader, a very good follow on Twitter. And this is just an interesting note that, fun fact, we've never not rejected at least a little bit from the first all-time high test on the major cycles. And there are examples of BTC at 32k, at 1k, and at 20k. Now, again, these weren't massive corrections by any means, but there is precedent for the market going through a bit of gyration and oscillation uh, as it approaches the all-time high price itself. I think the reason for that is that the closer you get, the more tempting it is to try to catch the breakout long, and it's kind of seen as a free money trade. However, if you position for that trade too early or at a bad price or with too much leverage, if too many people do that, then the trade just becomes very crowded, and that amount of excess leverage and added open interest from likely paper-handed participants uh, becomes pretty easy to flush. And then by the time the market actually breaks the all-time high, uh, those over-eager participants are out of the market. Now, whether that will happen in this instance or not, uh, I have no idea. Part of the reason I have this reluctance is because the nature of this uptrend has violated a lot of the previously sound principles in terms of Bitcoin's price action, most notably the 20 to 40% corrections and the, the market participants were used to from historical bull cycles. Uh, that's from a price perspective. And then from a time perspective, uh, the cycle is also anomalous in the time taken between uh, peak to trough to peak. Uh, this is one of the fastest recoveries ever, I think, certainly in the modern era of Bitcoin trading. So with that in mind, uh, there's certainly no guarantee that the market is going to slow down at around all-time high. Uh, it's certainly, I wouldn't propose an idea where you short the all-time high. That doesn't seem particularly intelligent. Uh, you know, even if you made money on those previous instances, uh, the market then continued after the fact. You know, it gave you a 10, 20, 30% pullback, whatever the prices were, and then it would go up for weeks and months. So purely in terms of lining up with the more attractive trade, it's not the selling all-time high idea is attractive. It's more that if you get some sort of over-leveraged flash crash dip from traders that are too horny around that price, uh, it's worth taking their coins and then watching them uh, unsatisfactorily observe the market rip without them. So if you get some sort of spike flush, too much aggression at the all-time high and there's like a mini correction, uh, I think that's probably a good trade, at least historically has been. Otherwise, given the nature of this uptrend and the amount of essentially price insensitive buying, uh, I wouldn't bet on it either. And I certainly wouldn't present it as a short BTC at the all-time high idea. I just don't think that's particularly wise. Even if it works out, you probably make more money uh, buying that dip than selling that rip. The more interesting part about the all-time high is not the all-time high price itself. It's more that the it's more the implications of the market making a new high. So again, if we take the, even the most obvious example of 20K, uh, what's exciting to market participants isn't, you know, 21K, it's the price action that followed in the weeks and months post all-time high break. So applying that in the simplest possible way to our current price action, uh, a lot of the positioning at the moment reflects the idea that we are essentially somewhere here. And so once the all-time high goes, we'll enjoy a similar amount of upside in terms of duration at the very least, uh, if not in terms of price appreciation, market cap increase and all that type of stuff. Uh, so that's what makes this, you know, these coming weeks and months interesting because if, if the past holds true and the all-time high is a kind of market-wide risk on continuation signal, then that generally means weeks and months of upside to come with sort of vast ecosystem expansion, inflows, FOMO, so on and so forth. That's probably the most interesting thing. Um, what I also wanted to discuss was positioning. Now, part of me kind of had made some notes for this episode of Monday Markets, and I wanted to talk about the death of the risk curve or the modern barbell portfolio. Um, the simplest way to present it is the following. Historically, uh, the, the market sort of kept up a facade that some tech was better than other tech. And so whenever you would trade crypto, if you had some sort of sense of what was conservative and what was aggressive, uh, you would go BTC as the most conservative. Then if you want to speculate a bit more, you would go to ETH and then you would go to large caps. And then potentially you'd go from there to mid caps. And then maybe even you'd go to low caps. And then there's all sorts of illiquid stuff here as well. Um, and 
this was to some extent keep up a veneer of sophistication and it was also just the conventional wisdom the btc goes first and you know it's at the top of the pyramid if you will uh, and then the wealth effect from btc as people make money on bitcoin and rotate to other things um it trickles down to the other instruments other market caps so on and so forth uh, and certainly this cycle or during the course of this uptrend that simply hasn't been true uh, if anything we've seen a leapfrog effect where if in the past you more or less adhered to this type of structure of starting with the least risky asset and then the wealth trickles down to the more speculative riskier assets it seems like this is a leapfrog type of cycle where market participants have essentially realized from the price action of 2021 2022 um so on and so forth that hey everything dumps when the market corrects like when there's a bear market there are no survivors so why don't i just more or less get rid of these and go straight here because at that point my upside is potentially larger if these things move more and they're more volatile and get repriced at a faster rate but then my downside well it's, it's more or less the same because stuff generally goes down in a bear market now is that framework 100 percent accurate i mean of course not there are a ton of caveats uh, that apply to these instruments and certainly comparing eth to low caps and meme coins and illiquid things um i don't think is I, th I think those premises need some justification uh, but the way the market's been trading is much closer to this leapfrog model uh, than the historical um risk curve trickle right so risk curve trickle start with btc and then you work your way down and then as the cycle progresses you work your way down as well so btc going up you might be early eth going up slightly less early large cap slightly less early so on and so forth uh, whereas now uh, essentially btc goes up and certainly when, when you have a single focused narrative like the etf uh, that's seen as a green check mark for risk in general and then the question becomes well where are most you know where are the most attractive trade opportunities going to be and so as soon as you've essentially settled the btc side of the argument that okay tick risk on we're fine now where do i go to make money participants essentially look past these previous categories and go straight for the lower market cap faster moving things okay and the function or the result or the consequence of this has been uh, as don tweeted some sort of barbell type or horseshoe type portfolio um where you have super safe super conservative uh, allocation on one side which is BTC and even ETH has struggled, as we've all seen. And on the other side is your speculative stuff, which is the low cap and everything else. And then your mid caps, high caps and other things uh, essentially get lost in the middle as you're mostly weighted towards, yeah, I'm going to play it safe and get BTC and it's been outperforming. But now that we're in a bull market, I want to make the most money I can and buy the most volatile, rapidly repricing assets. And that's going to be the low caps. And so if you're somewhere in the high to mid caps, uh, you kind of get overlooked. And that's been a feature for quite a long time now, and especially in the last week. Uh, we've seen that come to fruition as well. Um, even if we look at Velo from a price change point of view, if we go to top gainers over the past week, uh, regardless of market cap, you have Pepe, Floki, Whiff, Bonk, Sheeb in, in a sort of category of their own. I think these are all dog and or meme coins, and that's very telling. And everything else is down here. I mean, Dogecoin is even the top... Um, altcoin slightly away from the top top performers then you have people ar and a bunch of other things so you don't see your dino DeFi here you don't see your eth here you don't necessarily see your mid caps here another way to visualize this is the following if we look at the funding apr heat map similarly on velo if you go to large caps i mean yeah some of the meme coins are large caps which is why sheep is up here and doge as well and it's hot ish uh, but reasonably balanced given market conditions uh what if we then go to mid cap well, suddenly you see some more with outliers you see darker colors in the mid caps so again um the, sorry lighter colors so the darker the color the more negative the funding rate the lighter the color the higher the funding rate which is the cost of being long and then if we go to small caps that's where things get really light so light to they're almost dark because that's where a lot of the speculation is taking place and where a lot of the longs are being leveraged and then probably the most obvious way of viewing this is if you go to top gainers and the funding on the top gainers just by looking at the list bonk and this is apr 233 percent and then it's the same coins floki pepe i don't know what rats is i'm scared to ask sheep something weird going on with xcc probably with the spot market i need to look at that i haven't looked into it ar dogecoin again people slightly outlier and then whiff at 500 percent so essentially if we take a joint view of positioning in the market right now uh it's the following 
Well, BTC is more or less at its all-time high. Even if it gives a tiny spike, it's more likely to break and continue, sort of 2020 analog, right? So we are in market participants view here. And so how do I make the most of this period here? Well, I'm not gonna go down the BTC, ETH, high cap, low cap, mid cap, low cap route, sorry, high cap, mid cap, low cap, illiquid stuff. And you can kind of join these together, two together route because I know that if the bear market hits, everything gets crushed. So what's the point of buying something with less upside if it's gonna eat a similar amount of shit in the bear market and lose me money? I might as well, as early as I can, go for the low caps, the more volatile ones, the rapidly repricing ones, because if we're in a bull market, everything is going to go up, but I want to get long the stuff that's going to go up the most. And th there are other arguments here that are tangential, of course, like the meme potential of meme coins and dog coins versus boring DeFi shit nobody cares about. And then if the one of the assumptions as well being made is that there's no retail here, we discussed that on the show, I don't think it's entirely compelling. It's hard to make that argument uh, when all of the top performers are meme coins, uh, Coinbase app is being rapidly repriced, etc. Uh, but the argument there, which supports buying meme coins, is that at some point, the amount of retail participation will really increase and peak. And what is what are those retail participants more likely to buy? DeFi coins they don't understand from n number of years ago, or new, shiny, exciting dog coin memes, viral TikTok oriented things. And so as a result, if you take all of this stuff together, it becomes some version of, well, BTC and the market, because we're at all time high, is going to go up for weeks and months. Retail is going to increase in number or join, depending on your view, in the coming weeks and months as well. Retail is more likely to buy meme coins and other things than they are to buy DeFi and high caps because of unit size bias, shareability, meme ability, viral ability, etc. So I'm going to front run them by buying those meme coins now and skipping the queue essentially of the high caps, mid caps and low caps because I want to get straight to the good stuff. And at least one underlying assumption there is that, oh, well, what about on a risk adjusted basis? Aren't you scared of the meme coins? The coy response is some version of, hey, bro, did you see the bear market? I don't remember the good assets being particularly different from the bad assets. And even if they were, the way they get quickly repriced when market conditions change mean that I'll happily take the drawdown risk uh, if the upside risk kind of pays for it or the upside opportunity at the very least pays for it. So that's essentially what we have on our hands right now. And it's created this barbell portfolio. It's created a lot of really aggressive positioning in meme coins. It's made, it's made it such that the top performers uh, are all sort of retail friendly, more speculative things. And that is simply the nature of the market. Um, let me see if I had any other notes that I wanted to share on market as a whole. Um, no, I think that's pretty good. At least I'm happy with it. I don't want to make this episode too long. If you want like a longer form deep dive on this kind of stuff, please let me know and I'll try to make a piece of content around it. Um, in terms of the TA stuff, I think that the low strife tweet covered most of it. This close to all time high, generally, even if you short and make money, which I don't think is a fantastic idea, but even if you short and make money, the odds of getting a macro pullback from all time high are reasonably low. Uh, the odds of potentially getting some sort of, even if you do get a slight pullback, for that to resolve as the overleveraged people get shaken out uh, and then push higher, that is a much more probable outcome. So in either case, uh, shorting the all-time high break just or around the all-time high doesn't seem to be the best idea on average. Even if you do get a pullback or a spike or a kind of leverage flush around the all-time high, I think that should preferentially be seen as an, as an opportunity to buy and take the coins from the overleveraged participants rather than looking for sells. Um, from a technical point of view, on the monthly time frame, we had our breakout through the monthly resistance, depending on where you draw it, but still, again, this close to the all-time high, I'm gonna be very skeptical of resistance levels as a whole. The only thing that would make this entire structure look suspicious, I think would be a monthly close back below 58K or even 57K. Uh, anything that basically doesn't quickly recover any dips and uh, a failure to just accelerate through the all-time high, resulting in a loss of the monthly range high, that, that would be very out of character, uh, but also just very suspicious in general. Uh, and then we could start making arguments for blow off top type of stuff, like, hey, well, meme coins were rallying before BTC even broke an all-time high, funding was this, funding was that. We can, we can get into all that type of nonsense, but I think that only becomes available if the market closes back below 58K. Uh, absent that, looking for material levels of resistance this goes to the all-time high uh, isn't my preferred approach and don't think it makes a ton of sense, okay? Um, other time frames also more or less reflect that, which, which shouldn't come as a huge surprise. You'll recall that we talked about this consolidation way back in the day, and I, I wish I held this signal, which was essentially once you get a weekly break, just kind of hold it because I'll probably set the trend, and that's already up 40% 
from there. Um, so nothing else on the weekly time frame that you wouldn't really get on the monthly. Same all-time high considerations apply. Uh, the only potential relevant level is on the daily, the most recent breakout consolidation. Um, I would even add a caveat to this that when these markets have broken out, when, when this market has broken out from consolidations in the recent past, uh, there's been no retest or anything of that nature. It's just been continuation. Uh, so I would just, if you wanted to, for medium term trading, mark out this consolidation. Uh, and if you get some sort of all time high spike, uh, it might not even be this deep. I mean, we kind of do some quick back of the napkin maths. Where would that take us? If we have this high, well, you know what? It's not terrible. We saw that the 2017 high breach ended up pulling back around 12% uh, before actually making a new all-time high. Uh, but that requires for there to be a lot of really aggressive leverage added into the all-time high break and the market not accelerating through it. Um, I would have this. It doesn't hurt to have. I'd say that if, if we get all-time high fuckery, which shouldn't be your base case and is not a good short idea in general, uh, if you do get it and you're looking to buy a dip from the people who thought they were going to break out trade and instead end up losing money, uh, I would do so uh, wherever you can, really, like wherever the liquidations take you if you get them. Uh, but in terms of levels, 62.5k, 61k isn't those aren't terrible, okay? But again, very, very weakly held views around the all-time high. The assumption should be that shit's going to break. Um, if it doesn't break and reverses, that'll be visible on the monthly. Uh, if it does flash crash, that's probably a good entry because all-time high, material all-time high resistance just kind of isn't a thing, okay? Um, and I don't have anything else on other time frames that would be relevant. On the ETH front, uh, very hard to keep up with BTC, all-time high break, understandable. ETH BTC, still anemic and unimpressive. Uh, maybe we get something around the 05 range low, but in general, if we see an all-time high break and acceleration, I think BTC, at least on the first bit of follow-through, will be very hard to keep up with. And then maybe post all-time high consolidation, this thing can breathe a little bit, but you know, we're very skeptical on this show of making excuses for ETH BTC. It's better for it to just show strength rather than... Um, assume it's going to show strength and th this thing kind of hasn't done much in the last couple of months again yes it's held up well relative to btc reaching its all-time high but that's a different argument from positioning an eth preferentially to btc um the altcoins i wanted to discuss are the following bonk dogecoin ajax fat filecoin floki ftm pepe she with my life is terrible i can't believe i said all those names out loud but here we go the general premise when the market is strong and if it continues to be strong is that on average your operating assumption should be that strong stuff will continue to be strong and weak stuff will be continue to be weak or at the very least if you want to take a more intellectual intellectually humble view of yourself you could say that the likelihood that i can rotate in time to catch the strong stuff before it's strong and sell the weak stuff before it's weak is low so i'm going to try to position with what's you know, give weight to recency as opposed to my own super predictive power. Uh, and with that in mind, looking at strong stuff again, just via Velo, you could look at top gainers and get some idea depending on the time frames you're trading. If you're more swing oriented, it might be a week uh, or even two weeks or even up to a month. If you're short term trading, it could be a day, it could be four hours even. Or what I quite like to do is when the market has undergone some sort of dip, especially in BTC, or if alts have kind of been pulled lower for whatever reason, uh, looking at the one hour time frame to see the kind of stuff that has a good initial reaction and bounces back. You don't need to use Velo for this. You can make your own watch list. There are all sorts of matrices and spaghetti type of lines available, but just being able to filter out what's strong when the market is weak is also quite helpful. Uh, so Bonk, again, from a technical point of view, you're going to have, you're going to be hard pressed really putting too much weight on TA in this instance. Uh, it's like all time high breakout type of territory. Um, as Don and I discussed, the, the reason this kind of stuff is so tricky uh, is because if you're looking for high time frame stuff, you're really not going to get it. And so your options are trend follow on low time frames or die. It's just most people either decide that that's not for them and stick for the high time frames and then complain that they're not getting an entry, or they're not getting an entry on fast, you know, quick, re rapidly repricing markets shouldn't come as a surprise. You kind of almost have no right to complain. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't say, oh, I'm only going to trade the high time frames. And then why didn't I catch, catch the fast move? There's a reason for that. Uh, at the same time, the other side of that coin uh, will get annoyed because they will concede that the high time frames aren't super, super useful. They'll go down to the low time frames and trend follow uh, and end up buying at a bad time uh, and for the only for the market to pull back or do whatever else. Uh, both both have a cost of doing business, right? Just sometimes it's more explicit 
uh, than not. So the high time frame cost of doing business is that if you're very religious in your adherence to the high time frames, uh, if you don't get an entry, you're probably just not going to get one. Or by the time you do, the market's just in a far less attractive place. And so the cost of doing business with a high time frame, yes, you get more certainty and you get better entries, but the downside is they might not get an entry at all, and it's not great for keeping up with fast moving markets because the time frames are higher and they are slower. On the other side, if you completely ignore the high time frames and you trend follow on low time frames, there'll come a point where you'll be getting buy signals on your low time frame trend following. You'll buy them and then you eat shit and the market nukes, you know, significantly past uh, your 5, 15 hourly level. And you think, oh my God, this thing's fallen off the face of the earth, whereas actually it's just pulled back to a high time frame level. Because you were so micro focused on the short term, low time frame trend following, you kind of lose perspective as to where the high time frame is. So again, no free lunch. High time frames, too slow, don't get an entry, too bad. Low time frames, trend follow. If you buy at a wrong time, you get liquidated, or at least you lose money on your on the signal that's generated by a larger pullback right? So at some point, if you're trend following really aggressively, and the market just kind of looks like this with very shallow dips, if you're waiting for the high time frame, you're not getting an entry, 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 but then maybe eventually it pulls back and gives you something, right? On the other hand, if you are aggressively trend following, then the same chart, well, let's make it a bit more realistic. So you're trend following, you get an entry, get an entry, get an entry, or the whole time, at least the market's kind of, you sort of, assessing the chart and thinking, oh, well, this moving average more or less is keeping up with the price. Uh, so by the time it comes down, I'm going to buy it, right? And then actually too bad, it's not a low time frame trend anymore. And there's a medium time frame or even high time frame correction. And then this ends up happening. So if we just take this diagram as a whole, if you're on the high time frame side, you miss out all of this, but you might be able to catch this. If you're on the low time frame side, you may catch all of this, but when this happens, you'll lose money. So pick your poison. There's no free lunch. Uh, so bonk, yeah, I mean, I could certainly go through the fruitless exercise of drawing levels on this and talking about uh, 24K or whatever this is. But e even even that is 40% away, right? So that's why a lot of the high time frame stuff just isn't, isn't super helpful. Uh, so your options are to either low time frame trend follow. And I've made videos about that before. I'm pretty sure on casual on all coin Thursday. So maybe check that out. Uh, or you're looking at low time frames at that point and looking for levels there and retests there and ranges there and consolidations there and moving averages there and correlated pullbacks with BTC there and bounces on in line with the rest of the market, etc., etc. So uh, that's bonk. If you want altcoin exposure and you're comfortable with the vol and buying high in the on the assumption that BTC is going to go up for four to eight weeks and the strong stuff's going to stay strong, um, that's that's certainly a choice. <laughs> on the uh, Dogecoin is also here a similar kind of technical argument that there's just a big weekly breakout and it's a dog coin. Right, and those have been strong as we've seen with Bonk, Doge, and Floki. Uh, and again, very similar. You're not uh, show me on this where the daily time frame pullback is. It, it's just not there. This time frame is inaccessible. However, you can see some long wicks on these things, right? So that should give you a hint that hey, maybe if I move my time frames down, there'll be something uh, reasonably appropriate there. And you can see as we work our way down, you can actually get levels on this thing if you so wish, but you're not going to get them on the, well, you get levels and flash crashes and reclaims and whatever patterns you're used to trading on high time frames. It's not like the market changes completely and all of them disappear. You just have to lower your time frames, and suddenly you, you have structures and areas and levels to work with, so on and so forth. So that's another one. Ajax is the AI meme, which we talked about on Altcoin Thursday, up a lot, obviously. Um, similar here, where, look, if, if we have the pullback level, uh, from the high, that's a that's a 30% correction. If you get an alt flash crash, might hit. Uh, your operating assumption should be that uh, I'm not going to get carried out by the alt flash crash. But I'm going to assume that a closer buy level of support is going to hold if you're going to be aggressive. And that's the assumption of all these low time frames. You're being aggressive. So then you have to look for closer buy, more local levels of support and lower time frame range lows, for example. 83, 85 cents, right? And again, cost of doing business. At some point, if you're buying all these low time frame uh, corrections, pullbacks, or whatever else, you make money, you make money, you make money, high time frame correction comes, you lose money. And as long as you make money here and you survive here, then you shouldn't be afraid to do business on low time frames. What tends to happen is small winner, size up a bit more, size up a bit more, really size up on the pullback, 
really oh no you're wrong and you, actually this one loser ends up wiping out all of your previous trend following gains that that's most of the time at least in my experience how both i've lost money historically on trend following when it's gone wrong uh, before i knew how to size these things properly uh, but also just looking at twitter and from trading experience to speaking to traders that that's how it tends to happen kind of the longer the longer the trend goes on uh, people start off using too little size and then start to incrementally increase their size as the duration of the trade also increases and then one loser where the five minute no longer provides a support and it's not a five eight percent pullback but a 15 to 25 percent pullback that one loser wipes out all of their gains so if you're going to be aggressive trend following these by using five minute 15 minute hourly low time frame moving averages low time frame ranges sfps all that type of stuff on low time frames be aware that there will come a time as the cost of doing business where you'll be wrong and caught in a larger correction as long as you make money on the way up essentially and by executing those trend following systems and you don't size up irrationally or disproportionately um for the inevitable loser you should be okay and also mechanical stops are a great idea for this where essentially instead of just like you know oh, i'm gonna buy the range low and sell the range high uh you have a at least some some form of trailing stop system that gives you new invalidations um fat similar look all-time high breakout uh if you look on the weekly nothing to do there if you look on the daily, it's just like six green candles, nothing really to do there. If you look on the four hour, even that's a bit stretched, right? Ever since this consolidation, not much going on there. Uh, and so realistically, you're going to have to start looking at much lower time frames than that. Hourly, potentially 15 minutes, and then you, then you have structure that you can start to work with. Uh, even then, this chart is actually a particularly egregious example uh, where it's not super straightforward. But if you want to really read into it, you know, you have some form of pre-breakout consolidation here. You had a weird wiki flash crash type of structure as well. Uh, you can go all the way down to the five minute and find your failed breakdown setups if you really want to try hard. Uh, but essentially, even if the lower time frames aren't super clear, they're certainly much more usable than the weekly, the daily, and to some extent, even the four hour. Like if you're trying to get, get an entry and you're just looking at candles that look like these, from a horizontal support resistance point of view, range point of view, whatever else, you're just not going to find a lot there. So you need to bite the bullet and go to lower time frames. Um, Filecoin as well, essentially weekly breakout. Uh, I think as long I don't want to see a weekly close back below this breakout level. The fact that it's pulled back already is slightly suspicious, but as long as it resolves very quickly and early this week, it should be okay. Again, on the daily, you might think, well, this is the support, so I'll buy that, but it would require the market to give back its entire breakout and be down an extra 20%. Now, if, if old swipe, we get an all time high, awkward, um, Leverage crush, maybe, but that shouldn't be your operating assumption if you want to be aggressive with this. So as always, you're going to have to move down your time frames and look for structure, you know, like this, for example, pre-breakout cluster, that type of stuff. And then at a certain point, you take the setup, let's say it goes up and you made money, you feel great. Then you take the same setup one or two days later, and instead of giving you a bounce, it just goes straight through and hits the high time frame level. Uh, as long as you manage your risk when you're wrong on these aggressive trend following setups, uh, that's okay. That's just the cost of doing business. Uh, I will also say that the sizing for aggressive low time frame trend following setups is super fucking important. Not only because there's that risk where if you get it wrong, you get wiped out and it essentially erases all the gains you've made previously. That's terrible. But also in general, because the trade frequent your trade frequency will be going up, on average, for most people, your sizing per trade should go down unless there's like a fantastic setup or clear edge in one case over another. You know, if you're trading the monthly time frame or the weekly or the daily and you're swing trading and you have a pretty low frequency, high probability setup, you're going to want to size those the fuck up because they don't come that often. And when they do come, it's quite significant because presumably the probability that you're right is also higher. So low frequency, high probability. But if you, if you consider this low time frame trend following out of 5,000 alts that are all going up, uh, that's arguably lower probability, but certainly higher frequency. And so if you want to kind of survive the variance, you're going to need to size down. And the frequency of setups that are made available for you when you're low time frame trend following makes up for the fact that you're sizing down and even to some extent can compensate for the lower probability or certainly if you're not used to trading those setups, um, the lower win rate, okay? Floki just fucking melted everyone's face. Again, on the daily time frame, you see a bunch of green candles. This is just not a whole lot to do on that time frame, to some extent, even the four hour. Um, and then you'll have to go down to your hourly 15 minute type of stuff to find some sort of horizontal structure, diagonal structure, low time frame moving average, or even whip out the CBS special, get some fucking trend lines on there and trade those breakouts. Like every, everything really works if you're in line with an aggressive 
low time frame trend. It's not strictly my expertise. I've got enough experience with it to get by. Uh, and again, I'm pretty sure I've made a casual, uh, altcoin Thursday video on it before, but it's more the process that will get into your mind that you need to pick your poison. Uh, that high time frame, low time frame trade off. Uh, at a certain point, you're going to have to say, look, I'm going to do business at 15 minute levels. You know, like whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna do business at my 15 minute levels. Got diagonals, horizontals, whatever. But I'm aware in the back of my mind that the high time frame levels are lower down. And if I have to take a loss trying to trade trade those levels, the market hits the high time frame one. I shouldn't be exposed to huge losses or liquidations. Okay. So I'm not saying you need to pick one in tunnel vision, but you need to pick one and be aware of the cost of choosing that strategy. The cost of the high time frame is that you might just never get a fucking entry. The cost of the low time frame is at some point you'll be wrong and as long as you don't get wiped out on being wrong you'll be okay okay um phantom is another one this is kind of threatening a weekly breakout it's very similar to phil where it's slightly higher market cap weekly breakout uh if these breakouts are strong um this should be able to get above the weekly open or at the very least not close back below the breakout level itself uh similar i mean in this case it's i mean there's some proximity to invalidation uh for this type of breakout thing which makes it a little bit easier um so maybe the level itself isn't the worst idea, but it, it would need to be very quick and not close below because most of the other breakouts that we've discussed, you can't even fucking see the breakout level because that's how strong the market is. So when you get something that breaks out and then starts to slow and bleed, etc., uh, you should put that shit on a timer. Think, okay, everything else when it breaks out, like all the strong stuff, it broke out far away and just mooned, never looked back. Why is this looking back? Either it's a very short time window where it's gonna, where I'm lucky enough for it to give me a pullback entry and decent proximity to invalidation, or I want no part of it because strong markets shouldn't look back like this. So I, I, I would say that in these conditions, when you see a breakout that pulls back, if it doesn't resolve very quickly, then just, just stay away from it. There are 50 other coins that are just going to break out and melt faces. You don't have to go through that, uh, through those trials and tribulations of, is it strength? Is it relative weakness? Is it pullback? Is it a lag? Why didn't it break out? How long do I give it? All that type of stuff. Uh, Pepe, again, one of the best performers, all-time high breakout, just, just straight mental, even from Altcoin Thursday. This is one of those where even if you look on the four hour, there's no real structure that you can work with until, what, 480s to 400s? And that's a, what, 50% correction? So even the four hour time frame on when, when using the low time frame trend following setting isn't useful. So you're going to have to go down to your potentially five minute, 15 minute, uh, and whatever fast moving av oops, whatever fast moving averages you have at your disposal will probably be more helpful. Uh, correlated pullbacks will probably be more helpful. Uh, very low time frame trend following tools more helpful. Daily opens more helpful. Bloody hell, even just like five minute spikes and support resistances and failed breakdowns more helpful. Daily opens more helpful, but it's just you're not going to be getting much from this daily chart at this point. Okay, certainly not if your if your expectation is that this thing I don't know goes here because the crypto market is going to go up for the next four to eight weeks, uh, then unless something really weird happens, you're not really expecting the strongest performers to pull back fifty to sixty percent. Okay, so if this is a non-starter on the daily time frame, then by definition the daily time frame is like a non-starter at least for where the market is now. Okay. Um, sheep again melting faces today. Don tried to put this dog down, but it's still live. Uh, a very clear example of just kind of strong breakout continuation. Like most of the stuff shouldn't really pull back if it's super strong. Uh, weekly time frame in that in that sense, yes, we could look at some historical levels, but big picture isn't super useful if you want to be aggressively trend following. Daily time frame very similar, right? Just just a bunch of green candles, but they have some wicks, so maybe the low time frames contain some pertinent information. Well, now we have at least something. We have these mini ranges and clusters that the market's been building on the way up. Those are interesting, and then if we look within those, we have sort of pullback ranges to work with if the market gives it uh, and if you if you need, if you want to play really close to the market you just have to either lower your time frame or, or use very fast moving trend tools but you kind of see from a process point of view if you look at look at this on the weekly you're like there's fuck all structure there you look on the daily you think there's still fuck all structure but there are some wicks there's maybe something to work with if i lower my time frame you look on the four hour you're like okay there are a couple consolidations at least then you look on the one hour and 15 minute you're like okay so there's some proper pre-breakout ranges and consolidations that if the market dips to without going all the way back down to the breakout level, I can still do my TA stuff reasonably close to the market, okay? Last one's with, um, I think this had a weird, quite a, quite a, I mean, look, you, you might think, look at this chart and say, well, yeah, it just came down and just kind of spiked the low and it's at the range low and at this historical, you know, this support resistance level or whatever, it's not a big deal. What's, what's going on here? However, if we measure this from high to low, 
that's like a 30% pullback, bigger than anything we've had on BTC. So if, if you're moving from trading mostly BTC, et cetera, and you start slinging altcoins, especially on the lower cap side, you just need to be aware of just how much higher the volatility is. And that should be reflected in your position sizing and or use of leverage if applicable. But similar, I mean, similar arguments here. On the weekly, it's like making all-time highs, not gonna find anything useful on the weekly. Sometimes you can, like you, weekly open if you're trying to aggressively trend continue, uh, trade the low time frame trend can be helpful uh you know the weekly open type of strategy previous weeks high or low can also be helpful either for breakout trading or for trading inside range failure if the market slows down a little bit but it would need to really slow down for the weekly time frame to be helpful we look on the daily we can say yeah okay there's some wicks and some structure but we're so far away from the breakout level there's not a ton going on here maybe this cluster at 0.8 but again you might think from a purely chart point of view that this is a reasonable daily level and maybe it is for a flash crash wipe or whatever but this is again another 40 percent from where the market is trading right now and overall 60 percent from the high now is it possible on something like whiff yes uh, but if you're trying to aggressively trend follow this thing and you want a piece of it uh, you're not going to be positioning for 50 60 percent pullbacks as your go-to if you're trying to aggressively trend follow then we go to the four hour and we at least have some sort of structure to work with right we can take the lowest close in this consolidation and say okay well i've got something here on the four hour that could be interesting then you, you also take the pre-breakout cluster maybe between 130 and the low at 116 okay well the four hour is giving me something and then suddenly you go down to the hourly and you have pretty decent levels to work with right we have the recent support slash a failed breakdown level at 1.5 and then you've got the closer recent consolidation before the breakout at 1.1 to 1.3 and then as always you could just move your way down and see if there are any new levels crop up but it, again it's not the levels per se that i'm trying to outline it's the progression from oh well this just moved too much what the fuck do i do and instead of just closing the chart you're like okay what time frame do i have to work down to to make my trading tools and the things I actually know how to use pertinent? And the answer tends to be just, if in doubt, <laughs> lower the time frame. And again, I can hear the criticism that, but if you lower the time frame, it just becomes all noise. And what if it really pulls back? Well, that's the cost of doing business. Again, there's no free lunch. You can't pick and choose and say, I would like the high time frame strategy for this one. It's like, yes, sir, of course. And then the market just pulls back to your high time frame level and you ding it. And it doesn't work the other way around either. We're like, I would like to trend follow, sir. And it's like, uh, sorry, I would like to trend follow this chart. And some AI robot says, of course, sir, every five minute support level will be respected perfectly. Please enjoy your stay. And suddenly you don't have to worry about the high time frames anymore. Unfortunately, it's not how it works. You need to, again, pick your poison, do both, or at least be aware of both. Uh, I've spoken for way too long. I have no idea how long this video is. I'm releasing it late. I might not even release it. I think it's just rambly nonsense. But if some part of it was somewhat helpful to someone, please, God, let me know. And I'll know whether to periodically make longer videos or whether to shut the fuck up next time woo somehow gives us money they're a good centralized trading exchange partnered with a much more robust and diverse set of designated market makers i think it's worth checking out if you haven't already it's a good way to support the show links in the description i'm tired bye